Jay Baba, it's nice to be back. Sorry, we couldn't come up. We were planning to come last year, but a, a sudden um, surprise heart attack kept me away. Um, <laughs> and uh, I spent a few days in hospital, and I'm better than you now. So whatever he does is just great. <laughs> Speaking of people coming to Baba, I, I remembered um, in Monthly Hall there was a gentle, there was a story about a gentleman who was walking in the Andes, hitchhiking, um, coming across to a loo on the side of the road. He goes, and there's just a hole in the ground in a shed, and as he sits down, he sees in front of him the card, "Don't worry, be happy." Altar Mer Baba, out in the sticks, nowhere. Three months later, he's knocking on the door of Merzad. How do people come to Baba? <laughs> I mean, really, how do? It's not something that we do ourselves. It's a calling. He sows the seed. He draws you to him. And most people who haven't grown up in a Baba family, um, they have been seekers. They have been disillusioned with what they've grown up with. I mean, children of Christians are Christians. Children of Muslims are Muslims. Children of Babalos are Babalos. But um, once you get disillusioned, then you start looking. My wife Pauline was looking. And uh, she came to uh, babysit my son while I was in a, a work um, do in the evening. And she saw pictures of Baba. And who is he? What does he do? Ah, and now she's here. And, <laughs> and uh, I, I, I'm not like my father. My father used to, Baba is God. Can't you understand that? It's so clear. But uh, I don't do that. I wait for people to show an interest, and then I talk about him. If there's no interest, I don't, because it's, it's, that time's not there yet. But uh, so... Talking about growing up in Baba families, um, I have heard this so many times. It, you are so lucky to have been born in a Baba family. Yeah. Generally. <laughs> I mean, as I was saying, we grow up to take Baba as God when we were one year old, you know, two years old, three years old. I was doing the Parodigar and repentance prayer at five years old by heart, um, and so was my brother. And um, it was just natural. People who are children of their parents take the same faith as, uh, as their parents. So there's nothing spiritual about it in that age. You're just doing what you're told to do. But when you grow up, then you start thinking. You all didn't have to think because you were already older. And the calling came. Um, and my thinking started when my brother died in July 1968. Um, he fell from, I'll, I'll tell you the story um, in a few minutes. And um, after he died, Baba sent a telegram. It was the strongest telegram I've ever, ever read. And I'll tell you that later as well. Um, but Baba had also said, um, somewhere, somehow, sometime, I'll meet my old and new lovers before I break my silence. And everybody at that time thought, it was a physical breaking of his silence. So we were all, the, the, the running joke in our, our home was, we can't die until Baba breaks his silence because Baba has not broken his silence and then my brother died. And I said, what the hell is going on here? So I talked to my parents about it. I was 14 years old, 13 years old. And they said, why don't you ask Baba? We are going to Baba next year. There was a Sahavas in May. And the Karachi group was going in May. Why don't you ask him? And I said, I'm going to ask him. So I spent weeks on wording my questions, you know. Um, how do I ask him? So in the end, I decided, Baba, why did Faridun have to die? That was it, you know, and uh, see what he says. And what do you think happens then? Baba drops his body. Without breaking his silence, what's going on? So then, doubts start arising. Is he a hoax? Are my parents duped? How can God be so frail and not at his word? And then I started a three or four year 
quarrel, a fight, a real hatred with Baba. But looking back on it, was, that was the time when I remembered him the most. It was almost every few minutes I was shouting at, in, 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 my, in my head, never outside, never in front of my family. But uh, I used to call him names, I used to berate him, I used to curse him, I used to laugh at him. Oh, God, you are God, look at what you've done. Huh? <laughs> anyway, but he was always with me, and I know that now. But uh, four years passed, I was 18, just getting into medical school. I think I told the story before, so if, you, if you've all heard it, then I'll, I'll skip it. But, uh, um, yeah, so it was a big turning point in my life. Um, I had a dream. It was the first and only time I've seen Baba in a dream, never again. Um, and this was before I was going to get into medical school. Now, in Pakistan at that time, we had five seats out of 1,020 a, a for minorities, Parsis, Christians, Hindus, even some sects of Muslims who were not cl classified as Muslims because they were waiting for the second coming of Muhammad. They were called the Ahmadiyyas. So they were um, officially classed as non-Muslims. So there were so many people going for five seats in medical school. And I was petrified. If I didn't make it, my name would be mud in the Parsi community. You know, it was just so much, so big a thing. And I was petrified. So I had this dream about three weeks before my results came out. Um, it's just so clear in my mind. I never remember dreams. As soon as I wake up, it's just going, 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 gone. I can't remember it. But I remember this vividly. Baba is sitting with his back to me at the head of a long table, and the table goes to infinity. It just goes on and on and on over the horizon. And on both sides of the table are perfect masters, heads of religions, popes and priests, sitting, discussing world affairs. The, well, the fate of the universe, sort of. And it, there's a huge uproar. The sound is so loud. And I'm standing behind Baba to the left, shouting, Baba, am I going to get through my exams? Am I going to get into medical school? <laughs> I keep shouting and nobody can hear me until the person to the left of Baba turns and says, Child, we are talking about so much more serious than your exams. We don't have time for you just now. Go away and Baba will deal with you later. And I start crying. Um, and as I'm going, turning away to go, the sound stops. All the noise stops. And I look back and Baba turns his head to me and he winks. <laughs> just the wink. He looks into my eyes, and I can never forget that. Um, and then he turns around. He, w he looked quite bored in, on that day, so he just slumped there. And the noise starts again, and all the um, arguments start again. And it was as if a, a piece of lead had fallen from my chest. I knew that I had made it. Three weeks later, the, the results were up in the university, and I didn't go to see them. Um, my friend rings me in the evening and said, oh, congrats, you got the third seat out of the five. I said, I know. <laughs> and I knew. And from then, not, not like a miracle, but from then, over the next couple of years, um, I grew to understand that Baba was always talking to me, that I didn't have to wait for the breaking of his silence. Baba was always talking to me. He was always by my side. And from then on, he's never left me. So coming to something a little lighter, um, I, wa I always want, want to say whenever I talk about Baba, everybody's seen Baba's films, um, everybody has seen videos, you've seen what Baba's like, but what did he feel like to touch, to see, to smell, to sit on his lap? What did it feel like? I think he, he smelled like sandalwood. Um, because Parsis use sandalwood a lot in agiaris, in fire temples, to um, the little bits of wood. That, and Baba smelled like that, pure, because sandalwood burns and leaves nothing behind. Um, 
he was a very short man. Even when I was that much, I could see he was, he was short. Um, and we used to sit on his lap and he used to see his skin. He was very pale and he was very fragile. And he was very sad looking. He used to smile, but he was concerned. He always had a concerned face. This, I'm talking about late 50s, early 60s, when he was after his accidents, when he was quite debilitated. He had a little paunch as well, so he had to touch his tummy. And I remember um, I was sitting on the hand of, the arm, of his armchair um, with his, my feet over his legs. And, uh, and he turned his head to look to somebody on the right, to talk to somebody on the right, and I pulled his ponytail. Um, <laughs> And, uh, and he turned around like this, and I pulled his ear low. <laughs> and my mother saw it, and she was furious, and she would have given me one on my backside. But Baba said, no. Children of this age are innocent. You have to teach them rather than punish them. So never punish a child of that age. Yes, when you're older and you understand what you're doing and you still keep doing that, yes, then you have punishments. But we use that against our parents all the time, even after we went home. No, Baba told you not to hit me. Uh, so that was great. <laughs> but he was just a big uncle that we used to go and have a holiday with. There was nothing spiritual when I was four or five or six. It was just a holiday. We used to run around. And because we were little, we used to have the um, chance to go with my mother to the ladies' side, where the Lady Mundley used to call my mum in. So we used to go with them and we used to play around. And I remember Baba, once he was coming out after a bath, he had a towel around him and he was dripping water. And I called him, I, I think it must have been 58 because I was very, very little. And I said in Gujarati, Sanda Panda Dadaji. Sanda Panda means naked, and Dadaji means God. So uh, the naked God is coming. <laughs> and everybody in the Mandali spoke Gujarati, including Baba. And there was an uproar of laughter. <laughs> As if, you know, God, I mean, can you, can you imagine God with a towel around his face? <laughs> but uh, those were the things that have stuck in my mind. Um, my parents came to Baba in very different ways. My mother a duck to water. She saw Baba's picture, Mino Karas from Karachi. Um, he introduced, um, showed, talked about Baba to her and to her parents. And mom said, this is it, I'm going to India. She was 16. And she said, I'm going whether you're coming or not to her father. Anyway, um, they were off to India. Mum says it was love at first sight. There was just this radiance that she saw, and she keeps describing it. I think you've heard it as well. She keeps describing it, and she just can't put the words to it. It was a radiance that she would just sit and look at him for hours on end, not wanting to ask him anything. No questions. Just sit with him. And it was unimaginably simple. It was just she knew that she had found what she was looking for. My dad, on the other hand, was very difficult. He was from a priest, Zoroastrian family. And his god was Ahura Mazda. And his prophet was Zoroaster. And it was unflinchable. And he met my mom in uh, 48. They were married in 48. And they talked about Baba, and, and Dad said, that's fine, as long as, uh, you know, um, you don't bring it up against me. And, you know, you can keep Baba, and I'll keep Zoroaster, and this and that, and okay. Um, but in 49 or 50, now, you have to forgive me, I can't get dates right, but I think it was 49 or 50, um, Mum wanted to go back to see Baba. And Dad said he would go with her. But he wanted to go in order for Baba to prove to him that Baba was God. Or for him to disprove that Baba is God to my mother. Um, 
so he went to Guru Prasad. Um, and Baba hugged, when Baba saw Mum, he hugged her and he held her. Are you all right? He always asked questions. And the questions were very, very personal. Have you had your bowels open today? First question he would ask. What did you eat today? Did you sleep well? Dr. Goer is here. Shall I call her? Anyway. So, and when it came, my mom introduced my dad, instead of hugging him, Baba just did that. And then he looked at the next person. No hug, nothing. In fact, my dad was said he was actually relieved that he didn't have to bow down or hug Baba at that time because his heart was closed, really. So for two days, Baba didn't look at him. He didn't get anything. Two days was it, and then they went home. And after a few weeks, something happened to Dad. He started getting up in the middle of the night, and he would cry. For no reason, he said. Just cry. He would go to work, and he would cry. He'd come back from work, he would cry. And it went on for weeks and weeks. And he wasn't depressed. He would just cry. His life was in turmoil because he thought something big was changing, but he didn't know what was happening. So in 51, they went back to see Baba. And my father was the one who said, let's go and see Baba this time. So what do you think happens? Um, they enter Guru Prasad. Baba is quite far away on the stage, um, sitting in a chair. Baba gets up from his chair. And he says, and my mom says he's calling her. So she, mom runs to Baba and he says, no, not you. Adi. So Adi runs over and there's a big hug. And he, Baba makes him sit beside him. And through the interpreter, he says, your heart was closed and I couldn't enter. Now your heart is open. So we have to open our hearts to let him enter. It's important. We have to make the effort to make him hear us so that he can give us his love so that we can go and see him. So from that time on, in two years' time, when mom and dad went to... Uh, see him, he wanted to leave his family and stay with Baba. He wanted to give his life up and stay with Baba. And Baba said, no, you have responsibilities towards your family. Go to Karachi and spread my word in Pakistan. So that was his orders to my dad. So he did that all his life. Um, so I'll come to the story of my brother then. Um, and that goes back to my dad's jobs. In 66, he retired from ICI, which is a big British firm, and he was looking for work. Um, but as with every important de uh, t turns in our lives, whenever something happened, we telegram Baba, and Baba made the decision for us. If you can't accept his decision, don't telegram him. <laughs> don't ask him, because if you ask him, you must do what he says. So a, a very good job in Karachi turned up, and we telegrammed to say it's better pay, good house, um, everything. Um, Baba said, no, wait for a better job. Why? Couldn't understand why. And me and my brother were in boarding school then, and boarding school was expensive, and we, my dad was not rich by any means. So after two months, another good job comes up, and another telegram goes off to Baba. This is 66. And Baba said, no, wait for a better job. What's happening here? I mean, isn't Baba wanting me to work anymore, he's thinking? So time passes, about six months. We are very down on money, thinking about getting children out of boarding school and back to Karachi. And another job comes up. But where's this job? It's not in Karachi. It's in Dhaka. Now, Dhaka was in East Pakistan, which is now Bangladesh, 1,000 miles of India in the middle. Um, so another telegram goes off because dad is now desperate. 
And Baba says, take that job, take the position immediately. Immediately. Right? That was it. We packed and we flew to Dhaka. Our, we were in Lahore, we used to go to, on holidays to Dhaka. So in 68, my brother and I were on summer holidays. We were playing on the roof of our bungalow. He fell and he had a, uh, a head injury and he had an intracerebral hemorrhage. Um, so we took him to the hospital. There were no brain surgeons around. We booked a brain surgeon to come from Karachi the next day. And in the meantime, what do we do? A telegram goes to Baba. Faridun has fallen, he's unconscious. Later on, we learn that when Baba received the telegram, he told Erich, Faridun has come to me. And then he sent this telegram while he was alive. He wrote this telegram while he was alive. We didn't know that before. He said, Faridun has come to me, his final resting place. Faridun is supremely happy. That was the first para. Then he says, therefore you, Dolly and children, you meaning my father, you, Dolly and children, remain happy in my love. And do not let anything come between you and me in this very important period of my avataric advent. Do not let anything come between. This is July 68. That's when my doubts started after my brother died. What happens later? In October, my dad's um, uh, two-year uh, contract runs out, and they offer him a two-year renewal of contract. Again, it goes to Baba. They received a two-year renewal. Should we take it? Baba says, return to Karachi immediately. Right? Pack your bags and go. What do you do? <laughs> Three months later, the civil war started in East Pakistan, leading to Bangladesh in 1971. Um, and uh, a lot of the West Pakistanis were either killed or they, they left with just their shirts on their back. They couldn't take anything out. It was disaster, but we got out because Baba told us to get out. So my brother, we had to go there in order for my brother to die. But he also looked after us. And he got us out. <laughs> well, you can only look back and laugh at, at how much he cared. But he cared about very little things. Um, like I said, he asked for your bowel report almost <laughs> every day. Why? Bowels are important. You should open your bowel every day. What did you eat? So in, in 63, we, used, we stayed a mile away from Guru Prasad. And we used to walk down to see Baba in the afternoon. And on the way was a restaurant which served quick food. So we used to stop there, eat lunch, then go. So every day Baba would ask, what did you eat? So we had chicken biryani today, doctor. The next day, chicken koftas. Next day was chicken curry. And for five days, it was chicken, 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 chicken. For so some reason, it was just that the menu said chicken. You know, there was no other ulterior motive. Um, so one day, Baba calls my father and he says, you like chicken very much? <laughs> he says, yes, Baba. <laughs> if I told you to stop, eating chicken, would you stop? He asks, he doesn't say. He says, yes, Papa. Don't eat chicken from today. We were around, my mother was around, Adi and Rhoda Dubash were around with their son, Merwan. Everybody in the room there was told, these seven, five people, not to eat chicken. <coughs> the next year, we went to boarding school in 64. And what do they do? They serve chicken four times a week then. <laughs> and you're eight years old. So those were difficult times, but we never, my brother and I never intentionally ate chicken. But we were petrified that one day we would. We wouldn't know what it was. 
but we learned to barter. We learned to barter an extra sweet dish for our chicken or an extra rice dish for our chicken. And we never went hungry. But they were difficult days. Because every time those chickens said, oh no, not again. <laughs> it was difficult to stop eating chicken when you're eight. Because we loved it. But now, I don't care a monkey's about chicken. It just doesn't matter to me. But that was the chicken story. <laughs> Um, so, uh, oh yes, the first time my dad met Baba, when Baba didn't hug him, he was sitting on the second row, Baba was not on the stage, he was on a chair at the bottom and everybody was sitting on the ground. Um, and he was eating, it was either an apple or a pear, I'm, I'm not sure if it was an apple, I Somebody said it was an apple, but it was something rather softer than an apple. But there was a core that was left after he had finished eating. And the plate was passed to be put away. And the plate came to my dad for some reason. And he said, oh my God, Baba has eaten this. I must eat it. This was his first time with Baba. And then thoughts came into his head must have bacteria on it. <laughs> Baba's spit and saliva have touched it. Oh, no, I shouldn't risk it. And he gives the plate to the person behind him. And then he realizes what he has done. And he turns around to get the plate back, and the core has disappeared into the mouth of the person who was behind him, an Indian chap. And he thought he had missed the boat. And that was one of the reasons he cried when he went home. That he had, it was maybe something that he had missed. But he hadn't. I think it was just, it is just Baba's way of, you know, step by step getting you to him. Um, <clears throat> in 60 or 61, am I doing all right for time? In, <laughs> in 60 or 61, Mera approached my mum. She heard that she was a very good seamstress. She used to stitch things, make clothes. She asked my mom if she would make sadras for Baba. Oh, yeah. So there were strict instructions. The sadra has to be from the finest cotton, the finest muslin that you can get. Send me a sample before you make anything. So they go back to Karachi. They get about six samples of different cottons. Um, they look for the best, they send it to Mera. Mera said, oh no, these are all too coarse. Baba, who's holding the whole universe on his shoulders, can't hold a little sadra on his shoulders. He's, his, his skin is so sensitive that he only needs the lightest and the finest sadras. What do you do now? Luckily, um, my dad was working in ICI, that was a British concern, and uh, his boss was British. So he talks to his boss, he says, you know, I have to do this, I have to get some cotton. So his boss was very obliging. So he gets in touch with somebody in England for us to get samples of English muslin, English cotton. So we get um, three samples of cotton from England. This, this really, this takes time. So um, my dad says, order it, order it, because it's taking, going to take so long, it, it has to come by boat. Because he, they ordered 60 meters, which is, you know, they had to make 10, 12 sadras she made in the end, and uh, each one takes four to six meters or something like that, um, with wastage and all. So order it, my dad says, even without sending the samples to Mera, I said, order it. it, it will take time to come. Then the samples go to Mera, Mera chooses one, and it is the correct one, mm -hmm. the one that we ordered. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it comes, then my mother, she sews four first, and sends them to Baba, Baba wears them one at a time, and then after she, he's worn one, she sends one of the four back to us. 
Um, and with Sadras, after Baba died, after Baba dropped his body, um, every time we went, Mera would give us something. So she gave us his pink coat, which is now back in the archives in Merabad. Mum's mum sent it back. Um, we had some sadras that Baba had worn that came back to us. Not necessarily the ones that Mum had made, but they were Baba's sadras. We were given garlands that Baba had worn in 61, 62, 63, 65. Um, I have a soap that Baba has bathed with which was just incredible. I still, the paper is stuck to the soap and I wouldn't touch it or take it out. Um, she gave us Baba John's hair um, in a locket, in a silver locket, which I've got. She gave us uh, a pair of slippers, completely worn, it, like a beggar's slippers. Um, we saw slippers in Baba House today and they're like new compared to ones that so you're so glad Baba has worn this time and time and time again. So I had brought one with me to England and one was kept by my mum. So I brought one after dad died because dad would keep one in his room, mum would keep one in hers and there was none for me. But after my father died, um, I got dad's slipper. So this time when I went back to Karachi in, uh, in December, my mum has Alzheimer's disease now. She is very forgetful. And she said, take everything of Baba's that I have, which I haven't given back to the trust. Take it away because it will get lost if I died suddenly. Um, people would throw it away. So I brought everything back with me. So now I have the pair. <laughs> and I've always wanted the pair for a, for a long time. So now I have the pair. But uh, I think one day it will all go back to the trust, it'll all go back to the archives because it's meant for a bigger audience but I just don't feel the time is right to part with these things. They are safe, they are well cared for um, but I think one day they will they will return. So that was Sadra. Um, yeah, um, when we were little we used to draw pictures of Baba and send them to him on his birthday pencil pictures of Baba. And usually we were pretty good drawers, my, we meaning my brother and I, always my brother and I, we were very close. So we used to start in October, November to see, you know, which photo shall we draw this time and we'll draw it. So there was one picture that we both drew of a side picture of Baba with his hand up, his fingers spread. It's like that. And he's explaining something to somebody. And I could never get his fingers right. I tried three or four times, rubbing it away, and doing it again, rubbing it away, and doing it again. I just couldn't get it right. His fingers were the most difficult to draw. His face was easy. My brother tried 50 times. He, he even tr he kept on trying until the paper tore and he had to draw the whole thing again. And he did that again and again and again until there were just a few weeks left of Baba's birthday and you know how much ma time mail takes that he had to um, send the letter for at least four weeks in advance. So he finished by the end of January. Um, and when Baba received the pictures, he took my brother's picture in his hand and he says, these are my hands. He never talked about his face or the, or the chair he was sitting on or anything else. He said, these are my hands. He touched the picture and we got it back. He said, and he sent it back to us. I still got it in his album. This is the picture of the hands and feet. Um, the feet story was, uh, again, in the early 60s. I would hazard a guess it was 62. But it was after his accidents and Baba was not walking very well. Um, and Baba decided to take the men, only the men, women were not allowed, children were not allowed, to Merabad, because we always saw him in Guru Prasad. Um, and uh, when they got to Merabad, Baba was taken up the hill, but it was in a chair, 
So there were four people lifting the chair. And my dad was on his front left. Um, and he was panting and he was tired. And even though Baba was not very heavy, the chair was pretty heavy. Um, but four people lifting, they were all short of breath. Um, so Baba's, Baba's hand was on both the front people's shoulders. He used to sit like that to hold, and his left hand was on um, my dad's shoulder. And uh, halfway through, Baba said, put me down. And everybody was very grateful of that. You know, they were all sweaty, and it was a very hot day. Um, and Baba said to my father, you are my legs today. You are my legs today. He forgot about his lack of energy completely. They were so happy. He was so happy to lift. He, left, he lifted Baba up again and he went up to the hill without, without um, getting short of breath at all. He was just up in seventh heaven. And Baba notices these things. You know, when you are tired, he will let you rest. When you're down, he will lift you up. When you're up, he will get you down. But, but that is also part of the game. But whatever is done, he does, is for the best. Um, these are all stories um, I, I, that I, I have tried to remember. The story of food, um, this was in uh, the early 60s. The Karachi group, as usual, were going to see him. No, it was earlier. It was, I'm not sure now. It was earlier. Um, it might be 59. The Karachi group each got a telegram to say, come and see Baba. Baba will hold Sahavas for one day for one week. We got a telegram saying, Baba will see you for one, sorry, for one hour every day for one week for the others. For us, it was one hour for one day. So at first we thought everybody had got one hour one day. Um, and then when we compared telegrams, it was odd to get separate telegrams. We get three telegrams for the Karasis, Arjanis, and the Dubash all got three telegrams. They all got seven days, we got one day. So it must have been a typo, we said. Um, we'll ask Baba, we'll ask Baba when, we, when we get there. Yeah, don't, don't worry about it. But, and then it was my mother. He's God, isn't he? He doesn't make typos. He knows what's he, what mistakes he's made. If he's made a mistake, he will tell me. I don't have to tell him. She never asked him any questions. Anyway, you go off. One hour, one day, it was our, our turn. We spend the hour with Baba, and my mum was sitting next to him on the left, about that far away. And Baba, after about half an hour of the hour gone by, Baba turns to her and said, Dolly, are you all right? Right? Yes, Baba. Anything on your mind? <laughs> no, Baba. Okay. Ten minutes later, do you have anything to ask me? She says, no, Baba. Okay. So third time he asked the same thing. Three times he asked. This is very funny. Why is he asking me? He said, no, Baba. I'm fine. Right. So the hour is up. Um, we go to get his darshan. And mum is given a hug. And she turns around and she's walking away. Aren't the others staying for seven days, he says. She says, yes, Baba. So are you going home today? She says, yes, Baba. Our telegram said one hour, one day. Would you like to stay? <laughs> yes, Baba. <laughs> Not only was she, we, did we stay, but we stayed morning and afternoon for seven days. 
and she is absolutely certain that if she had asked Baba if we could stay, he would have said, go home immediately. She is absolutely certain. She never asked. We were ready to go home, but I would have asked. <laughs> you know. but that's that. Um, once when we were in Guru Prasad, between the morning and afternoon um, Sahavas times, we used to have lunch with either the men, male mangli or the women mangli. Mum used to go to the women, and we were young enough to go to the women mangli as well, so we used to see Baba there, because he used to eat with the women, and the men used to eat with the men. But um, once we grew to seven, eight, we were taken to the men's side. So we were little then, so it must have been late 50s or very early 60s. And uh, everybody was eating. Baba was eating. And one of the Karachi group ladies, I, we used to call them the three witches. They were the three sisters. One was old, one was fat, and one was thin. It, they were absolutely like, like the three witches in, in the cartoons. <laughs> um, so we, me and my brother, we always used to make fun of them. So the older one had a third of a plate of food left in. And she was going to the, ki to the kitchen side to scrape the food away. And Baba saw her. And just before she did that, he said, what are you doing? He got so red and he got so angry, I was afraid. <laughs> and I was not even near him at that time. I was quite far away. We were all afraid. And then he explained, I am in every grain of this rice. If you throw it away, you throw me away. All the plates in the room emptied immediately. <laughs> Everybody emptied the last, and, and they were licking the place and everything. <laughs> um, but it is a good lesson to learn. Um, never waste food. And Baba didn't like food to be wasted. He was very particular. Um, my mum tells me the story of uh, 58. That was the first time we went to Baba. No, 50, 59, 60. Yeah, 60. I was five years old. My dad had already gone earlier to Pune. My mum was in Bombay with the three children because there was too many days with Baba and there was, it was too difficult to take care of the kids. So um, she and the kids were coming to see Baba for one or two days and then going back. Um, so she was bringing three kids, one five, one six, and one twelve, alone on a train from Bombay to Nagar and then to Meribha. Sorry, from Bombay to Pune. Not to Nagar, to Pune. <clears throat> and the train was late. It was a train that would have arrived at six o'clock in the evening. It didn't arrive till eleven. And on the train, my mum was petrified, really very scared. She says, I was very scared with three kids, luggage, and uh, how do I get to the trust office? Maybe I'll take a rickshaw, I'll manage. But then the person beside her says, Madam, rickshaws stop working at 10 o'clock in, in Pune. How are you going to get to your, your, wherever you're going? She says, I don't know. And she says, Baba. Papa, Papa, in her hand all the time. What do you do now? There's no, there are no iPhones with you, no emails around, <laughs> there are no, no phones even. <laughs> the station is dead shut. But what she didn't know was that from eight o'clock, Baba kept calling my dad. Where's Dolly? Is she all right? Yes, Baba, she'll be here. She's bringing the kids. Half an hour later, is Dolly all right? She's not here yet. Oh, Baba, she'll be here. She's bringing the kids. She'll be fine. And at 10 o'clock, Baba says, go to the station immediately. And he sent Pendu with my dad to go to the station. 
So they both went to the station. The train comes in at 11.30. My mum is terrified. Um, my dad takes one end of the train. Pendu takes the other end of the train and they check each carriage and they're sh shouting, Autar Mir Baba Ki Jai! Autar Mir Baba Ki Jai! And mum can hear them from far away and she says, Oh God, I'm saved! Baba has saved me! <laughs> Somebody is here! <laughs> and both are shouting, Autar Mir Baba Ki Jai! And getting, going from carriage to carriage until they found her. Uh, but she, that was the first time she says she was scared. Not that she didn't believe in Baba to save her from trouble, but she was really scared. And th these were times when m women didn't travel alone, um, in the night especially. So it is something that Baba does. He's, he's an uncle and a father as well as a friend. And he looks after you. And he did that. And he did that for everybody. God knows how he found the time. But he, he God knows. <laughs> A Freudian slip. <laughs> but uh, he found the time. And for everybody, and you can see that in the videos, he, he spent how many 65 year olds would sit in a chair and let 10,000 people one at a time come and embrace him? Could we do that? We couldn't do that. And he was frail and he used to do that so many times, but he used to do that with joy. That's because he loved us. And the least we could do is, oh, love him back. <laughs> right, um, coming to the end, just one more story. Playing cards with Baba. Um, my dad played cards with Baba. It was mainly men who played cards with Baba. The women were not in included. And if we were playing Rami, um, people used to always want to sit on the opposite side of Baba. Because the, pe the team which lost would have to rub their noses in front of Baba at his feet. So they all wanted to do that. So nobody would go into Baba's team. Anyway, so, and they would try their best to lose. So if you had a good card, you would give it away, <laughs> so that Baba's team won. <laughs> and although everybody knew that, it was still a joy. <laughs> because in the end, this line of people rubbing their noses in front of Baba at the Master's feet, it was just a sight. And my dad would say, I wouldn't give my place up to anybody in the world to do that. I just wouldn't give my place up to anybody. Well, um, I think we end there. I just wanted to say something. Um, I'm, I'm not a teacher. I don't teach Baba's teachings. I just try to do what Baba says. But I have found that in centers over the years, Baba's teachings are becoming more complex and more complicated. People are making Baba more complicated. People are worrying too much about sanskaras and not about enough love for Baba. And my only advice is keep Baba simple. Um, Baba has not brought a religion. Baba has only said, love God and love all living things. And remember him all day. And it's as simple as that. If you want to read, that's fine. If you want, you know, he has written lots of stuff, but he's also said, people don't need to read to come to me. I'm not an avid reader of Baba, but I find that I don't need to do that in order to love him more. I love to hear new stories about Baba. But uh, the serious stuff, leave it to him. Don't worry about sanskaras and planes and are, are we on the fourth plane? No, we're not. No, we are, must be on the third then. No. Um, leave it all to him. Just keep it simple and he will do the rest. Jai Baba. Jai Baba. Jai Baba.